Hello and welcome to the Inquisitor podcast. Today, my guest is Barnaby Winter. He's a brand creation expert with over 35 years experience and 570 brands to his name. And he's also a founding freeman of the Company of Entrepreneurs. Barnaby, welcome. Uh, hi, Marcus. Really glad to be here. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, tell me this. What, what is a brand? I think it's like already a great question. Let's be quite clear about this. There are two words that float around the industry. There's branding and there's brand. And let me be quite clear. Branding is nothing to do with brand and brand is nothing to do with branding. Branding is effectively what a lot of people do. They spend a lot of money with designers. They create a logo. They create a look and feel. And they often end up putting lipstick on a pig. And mm -hmm. effectively, what they're doing is they're wasting their money, kind of tarting up something that isn't really a brand at all. And then people call that brand. And often when I ask this from, from, from the stage and I say, what do people, people will say it's the logo, your look and feel is what people think of you. It's something in the consumer's mind. It's none of those things. So we kind of discovered this in 1999 when I, I became youngest MD of a top 200 advertising agency. We had a thing called the brand bucket, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little while. But actually, when I asked the board then what a brand was, they came up with, we, we filled six sheets of A1 uh, flip chart paper with lots of different answers. And I've got a list of 74 different answers of what a brand is. So we then went through a definition process, took about three and a half months. So the definition of brand that I have been following now since 1999 is a, we define brand as every experience that affects the relationship between a product or service and its buyer. Let me just, it might be worth just decanting that out. A brand can only exist in the mind of a buyer because until you've given up your money or time, and, and money is just a reflection of time because you have to go and earn it for most people anyway. Until you've handed over your time in the form of money to somebody, you don't really have a true sense of what the, what the, the, the brand is. But the key thing about brand today is it's a relationship that you value more than the relationship you have with the money in your pocket. And then less, so what you have to do is you have to create a, a business system, a business machine, which portrays that sense of relationship at all levels, from top to bottom of the business, from initial engagement to long term loyalty. And you portray that in such a way as it always looks like the relationship is worth more than the, the people's relationships with their money. And then if you get that right, people will give you their money. And that's how effective you, you create commercialized relationships, which is, I think, what, what selling is about and is, is very different to the way people approach things, I often find. So I, I think part of the problem is that often organizations fail to have continuity and alignment between marketing, sales, customer success. And as a result, every time a customer or a prospect touches the brand, for want of a better description, there's inconsistency there. And I think brand is really about the promise as much as about the experience. And if, they, if, the, promise, if the promised experience isn't what was uh, offered, um, then that creates a disconnect. And I think that's where you start creating resistance with buyers. And marketing is the prime driver in any organization. Sales is a subset of it. But I, I think the silos that exist in businesses are significant and problematic because they're all about you internally rather than being focused on the customer. So what do you have to say to organizations where they're struggling to fill their pipeline with the right kind of customers and they're struggling to get deals over the line because they're spending an awful lot of time trying to convince people instead of attracting the right kind of people through their brand. So I think there's a whole language problem that we've got here. And even just listening to you, Marcus, as I can sort of hear, hear a disconnect with the language. The first thing is you don't, you don't get more customers. The use of the word customer is a fundamental flaw in most businesses. And I think whenever I work with my clients, it's one of the words that I ban, and we call it a C word in our business. We're not actually allowed to use the word. So I don't, I don't tend to use the word. In old days, we used to have a, a, a fine box that if anybody used the word, the C word, they had to put 50p in a box. And every, every Christmas, we'd have a great party. There's, a, there's also an F word as well. So we have an F word and a C word. And uh, so I don't use that word. Any 
word that assumes you are already in a relationship with somebody. I will swear momentarily. So that's clients, customers, users, members, you know, all associates, whatever. All of these words assume you are in a relationship with somebody. The moment you do that, your systems and processes are fundamentally flawed. So what happens is there is an you are you are assuming you're in a relationship with somebody. And actually, perhaps when I came into industry 30 years ago, when choice was limited, media exposure was limited, it was limited to a few national newspapers and two TV channels. Actually, the power base sat with the, 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 the product owners and the service owners. Now we're in the digital economy and the, and the knowledge economy. The power base has completely shifted to the buyer. They know more about your business than you do. And you're fussing about building systems and processes that are either easy for you, as you mentioned earlier, and make it easy for you to scale and you to do this and you to do that. But actually, the, the buyer is saying, no, actually, I get to choose whether I use your, your, your business system to solve a problem that I've already identified. So what happens is that the tie-up, where most organizations go wrong is they, they try and push out their system and process into a market that doesn't want it, that simply doesn't want it. Okay. Whereas actually we wake up in the morning and, and, and you know, the research is, is, is ever clearer now, but, you know, the, the research is telling us even now or prior to, to lockdown, and I think it may have gone up, up from this, that 88% of all buying decisions start online. So what you've got to do is you've got to, you've got to be in the stream of consciousness that's the knowledge economy so that when people wake up in the morning and say, do you know what, I've got, I've got a bit of a challenge. I've got a problem. I don't know where to stay tonight. I don't know where, 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 the, nearest, what, where the nearest Italian is. I don't know what, what I need a new piece of furniture. I, 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 I want to paint my house. I want to go on holiday, whatever. We all go onto Google and start searching on that. If it's a particular product we want, then we probably go straight to Amazon and we start looking at it. Can I just clarify, are you talking 88% of all buying decisions or consumer buying this. Well, so I, the, the, the research is consumer-led, of course, on this particular thing. But the, the evidence, if you look at what Gartner are producing right now, the evidence is that that's mirrored at B2B as well, so business to business. And there's a very simple reason it, for that, is because there aren't any businesses. Everybody keeps talking about this thing called the SME sector. Well, I, I've got some news for you guys. There isn't one right? There used to be one, and there isn't one. If you look at the numbers, there are nigh on 6 million registered business in the UK. And the, the shocking statistic of that is that 4.2 million of them have no employees, and only 7,250 companies in the whole of the United Kingdom have more than 250 people working in them. And in between there, is a few, another million or so that have less than 10 employees. But when you average it out, it works at three employees. And there's possibly only about 200, maybe 220,000 businesses that have between 10 and 250 people. Now, I'm sorry, guys, but you going out and thinking this is B2B, the majority of B2B owners are individuals like you and me. And they're going to make the same decision about their business as they're going to make about the car they buy, the furniture they buy, the food they buy, the restaurant, the holiday they go into, they go on to. The reality of that is the decision-making process is identical. So I'm quite happy to stand by, okay, if the research is saying that B2C, 88% of decisions start online, it wouldn't surprise me if it's damn close to that in B2B as well. Because Well, you don't, you don't sell to a business, you sell to a human being. Correct. And we're creatures of emotion. And right. at least 95% of decisions are emotional. And uh, if you don't recognize that, then no amount of technique, no amount of clever so where, marketing... Where, where, do you get, where do you get that statistic from then, Marcus? Where, that, that... Um, it's, from the research, it's from the research that Gap in the Matrix have done. They've spent the last four years investigating the neuroscience and the biochemical yep. processes yep. people use to make decisions. The reason why I ask that is it sounds like it's new news. I was trained on a thing called UpGuy, uh, uh, Unilever Plan for Great Advertising, and it had two key constraints in it. All decisions made up of emotional and rational decision-making. 
that has always been true. The brand bucket that we've been using since 1985 to launch over 4,700 brands uh, worldwide starts with an emotional engagement and then kicks into rational. So it has always yeah. been true that. It's always been true. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. There is nothing, nothing new under the planet. No, I mean, absolutely. you're not going to override 300 million years of evolutionary hard. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be scared before you start worrying about whether you're going to run down a hole or climb up a tree if a, if a big animal is attacking you, you know? So it's going to be emotional first. I'm afraid that's the rules, you know? So that's how we are constructed, you know? We, we, we buy emotionally, we justify rationally. No, and okay. I, I, okay, so I don't think you buy until you've squared the circle between the emotional and the rational. So you... Isn't you, that what I've just said? No, because you said you 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 didn't quite say it like that, or I didn't hear it like that. So you might you might have meant that, but that's not what I heard. You said you justify you justify rationally as if you justify the purchase. Again, it's a language thing. Of course, it's always a language thing. If you mean prior to purchase, you justify the yeah. purchase. Then I agree. Yeah, okay. yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and, yeah. Unless I bought myself a, an overpriced uh, convertible because I, I liked the button uh, to start the ignition and the engine yep. sound was great. Then I spent time justifying the purchase in that, and the idea was that when my clients saw me arrive in this uh, monster, they'd know that I was successful. In three years of owning this money pit, they only saw it once. Yes. One client yes. saw it once. Yes. But I, I found a way to justify it rationally. I think we, we forget that there is a syntax I think the way people make decisions, I'm curious about your thoughts on this, particularly when we're making important decisions, is we make space. And the process of de uh, deciding to buy something happens long before the marketing kicks in and long before a salesperson turns up. Then you start to look passively and you start to spot the car or you start seeing white papers and books and you you know you might consume some content when the problem starts to grow then you start to look actively and then you start to compare and contrast and you make trade-offs between the different options and certainly consumers are doing this when they're going on google they're doing price comparisons feature comparisons and they're looking at reviews and then they make the decision once they've made those trade-offs and then they use the product and if the product delivers what they expected, they continue to rent that outcome. And you don't keep customers for life unless you're continuously listening to what they're saying, you're co-developing the product and services with them, and then it becomes habit. But that syntax is something that most sales and marketing uh, people forget or don't realize. And yeah. the net result of that is it might sell them something which um, may appear on the surface to be right, but often it disappoints. And so it's only a matter of time before you're fired. So the, the, the brand bucket model was, was developed to exactly map that journey. It's slightly different to the way you've described it and certainly what we're putting into practice right now for, for major corporates and, 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 and startups as, as, at the same time follows a slightly different stepping stone approach to the one you've described, but it includes all the things that you're talking about. And so the six steps... Can you that talk we, us through it? Yeah, of course, of course. So the basic premise is that, that I will use this word only once because obviously it's a swear word, it's the F word, right? That a, lot of, a lot of processes that are, that are driven are driven by a thing called a funnel, a sales funnel or a marketing funnel. Mm which is why it's an F word, because we're not, I'm not allowed to use that word because the problem with that particular mindset is it's designed for the media owners, it's designed for the people getting the messages in the sense that they want to pour your money into the top of the, of the hopper. I'm going to use the hopper as an alternative word because I've found that as an alternative and I don't have to pay a fine for you not using the F word. And then they, they let it all pour out all over the floor because that's your job to sort that out. And that, that's, that's led to this, exactly what you were talking about, this disconnect between uh, pre-sales, sales, sales, and after-sales, right? Nonsense, all complete nonsense, right? There's, there's one journey. So the one journey is defined in the following way. And this was a result of an 18-month piece of research by a gentleman called Stuart Ball, who ran a, a top 40 advertising agency and a, a team of, of planners uh, there 
when they were commissioned by Saab to map how people bought motor cars. And the, the journey goes as follows. The first thing you've got to do is you've got to raise awareness of your particular product or service in the marketplace. And there's techniques for doing that. And this is where branding may has a, have a role because you've got to have a nice logo and brand properties and various other things. But if you just raise awareness, if you just tell everybody you're there, what people say is they say, I've heard of you. And you go, fantastic. And they go, well, I've heard of you. And you go, that's brilliant. Well, I've heard of you. You know, it's so, so what? So actually, raising awareness in its own right is not enough. The next step you have to do what we call image match. Now, image match is where you need to match to the image of the prospect. This is how we replace the C word that I was talking about earlier. We only talk about prospects, prospect thinking throughout your business. When it comes to selling, sales, marketing, whatever, you should be always thinking about the prospect. The prospect is somebody who wished you didn't exist. They wish they could get on with their life without you blighting their life with your amazing solution to a problem they never even knew they had, right? They don't want you there. They scrub you out. So image match is all about matching to the image of your prospect. Because, of course, we buy from people we like, right? But we did some research in 2005 where we thought something had changed because of the onset of the digital economy. We were four, five years into the internet taking a hold, and we, we wanted to see what, whether that had changed anything. And we learned something really, really important, that we found that people didn't just buy from people they liked. They buy from people who are like them. That changed the dimension of image match because what we have to do now is we have to engage with people who are heading towards us emotionally in their style. And the problem with most salespeople is they try and they have their own style, their selling style, they use their corporate style. And actually, then they're running a real risk of me sitting there going, I don't like your style. I don't like the way you do things. I don't like because actually I want to buy from an organizer that's in my so of course when we go into the big massive field of choice that is the interweb, right? We look and we go, oh, oh, they've got red. I would never buy anything from a company that has red in it. There's just I wouldn't because I'm a Chelsea fan. It's just not, it's not gonna happen, right? Just forget it. If you've got red, I don't care how good you are, you got red in it, or I don't like your language, or I don't like your style or your imagery or or all that sort of thing. You've got to be in the style of the prospect. So the first step is raise awareness, the second step is image match. So I've heard of you, I'm familiar with you, and I like you because you're like me. They are purely emotional steps. Now, I have come into the market with a known problem. So where I think it's slightly different, I don't think... So I'm looking for help, I'm looking for assistance. And this is where, where the challenge of sale was a, sh a ground-shifting uh, book when it came out, the work from CEB, Chief Executive Bureau in, in America, the challenger sales said, actually, what you've got to do is you've got to start to flood the market with insight at this stage and demonstrate that you're a subject matter expertise. And that exists both at personal brand level and at corporate brand level. You've got to demonstrate that you know your onions. And if you want to develop a personal brand, you've got to become the expert in something and then really portray that at image match to say, look, let me show you how I'm an expert in this, or I'm an expert in that, or, I'm an, or let me help you. What are you looking to achieve, right? Okay, have you thought of this? Have you done that? Have you looked at these areas? And you've got to behave as an expert would in an independent way and show that. Now, of course, they're going to like you for that. And then they're going to go, oh, I like the way they help me. They like me. So that's the first two steps. So you engage them emotionally. If you get this right, they're going to say, so what is it you actually do? <laughs> because... They know you, they found you in because they were looking for a problem and you've been really helpful. And they go, so what is it you actually do? And you go, well, uh, what we do, and this is where salespeople go crazy again. They list out features, 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 features. They blind you with all that. We do this and it does that and it twists like this and it goes faster like that and it uses less fuel like this. And you go, no, 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 no. I, I think you've misunderstood my question. I asked you what you do. And I said, and the salespeople just look at you and go, well, yeah, I'm telling you what we do. We're really brilliant at this and we're great at this. And we've been doing it for years and we've got loads of lawyers and we've got loads of accountants and we we do this and we do, you know, and you go, no, no. So, and, then, and then they go, well, what salespeople do is they start asking questions. They go, well, what about this? They're looking for the opportunity. And in the end, you just get bored. You just go, oh, I'm, I haven't got time for this. 
I'm it's sorry. It's I really like haven't... doing photos of your ugly children to strangers and wondering why they don't get... Uh, Correct, don't... exactly. And, and the, because the question is misunderstood. The question that's actually being asked at this third stage, which we call fax match, which is where the buyer has has found you, they came into the market with a problem, they found you, they kind of like the cut of your jib, they think they're your style, and they then ask you what you do. What they're actually asking is, what do you do for me? And of course, you need to be able to answer that. Well, actually, if you come with us, we're going to give you this, we're going to give you that, you're going to get this, the way we're going to change your life. We're going to do the, here are all the benefits of working. One of the fundamental problems that most most businesses have is they can't even express the benefits of the work they do. They really just can't do that. It's very frustrating. And that's because they haven't done a really fundamental thing, which is to find their value proposition. So that's the third step. So I've now found you, I'm familiar with you, I like a cut of your jib, and I've asked you what you do for me, and you've answered the question. At this point, we found in the, the research is people go, that's brilliant. I've got all the information I require. When I need somebody like you, I'll come back. Now, the salespeople then go, okay, I'll, when can I come back? Can I ring you tomorrow? Can I come around tonight? Can I ring you next week? Can I put in a thing in the diary? And you go, actually, no, no, because they don't mean I'm ready to buy and I am just, just need to go and get the money out of the bank. What they mean is you're not the only one. And they know you're not the only one. And if you've done your, your features thing really well, that you've given them an amazing way to go and buy from your competition because they've got a nice long list to say, well, I definitely need all of these things. And so they ring the next person. And they go, so what are you looking for? And they go, well, I'm looking for all these things. And they go, oh, yeah, we can do all of that. And by the way, we give you a bunch of daffodils at the end. And they go, oh, the other people didn't offer me a bunch of daffodils. I kind of, well, for the same money, I get, I don't really need a bunch of daffodils, but actually you're giving me a bunch of daffodils. And you lose the sale because you've trained them to buy from your competition. Whereas if you communicated your benefits, then actually what people say is they go away and they they choose. But the point is they disappear. Now, the the salespeople and the marketing people and the media people, they they love all this. Because what they want to do is they go, ah, what you've got to do is you've got to keep selling. You've got to keep advertising. You've got to keep SEOing. You've got to keep paper clicking. You've got to keep doing, you've got to keep blasting the world because if they suddenly decide to come back and you're not there anymore, they're not going to come and buy from you. This is a fraud. It's a fraud of the broadcast industry, which is not unusually on its knees. TV, soft as ever at the moment. We've got rubbish TV ads because the people who are using TV now haven't learned yet that it doesn't work. If you watch peak time TV now, you're watching what we used to call daytime ads on peak time. All the big brands have all disappeared. Back in the 1950s, all the Madison Avenue ad agency had psychologists who drove the advertising. Correct. And that's what made it interesting. Now it's being driven by a bunch of fluffy lovies who are focused on creative because they want to win a bloody award. Actually, I think, well, I hope nothing that I see on television ever wins an award because I think I... I, No, I agree. No, I think think it's being run by... Strategy, strategy people now, and people who just who actually don't understand what advertising is about anymore. Because advertising was always an inbound mechanic; it was a way of broadcasting. It was creating desire for things. People are not creating desire by telling you lawyers for you, or, you know, you're gonna and 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 whatever. It's just it's just awful at the moment. I, you're right. Yeah. There there are still these crazy creative things where people try and make themselves famous, but they're they're being done by kids that have just come out of art school who have got a job in a big advertising agency and watch mm-hmm. a lot of YouTube, knowing that they're neither their client nor their bosses do. Because unfortunately, if you subscribe to the best YouTube videos, I guarantee that within four months they appear as television ads. You know, ever thus, these young kids are watching YouTube and they go, "Oh, we've got this brief," and that that would work for this brief. And then they go and present it and then we go, that's really clever. And then they go and copy somebody who spent hours putting yellow stickies across a wall or something or every single ad I see, which I think, oh, that's quite good. I just go onto YouTube and find the original YouTube ad, uh, YouTube film that somebody in Asia has done or something like that. You know, it's, they're all copies. There's no originality there. It's shocking, shocking. And then they go and win an awards with it and you think, really, really? Mm-hmm. Come on, guys. You are some old duffers there who really don't know what you're talking about anymore. It's really, it's why advertising has become irrelevant now in the grand scheme of things. So 
we're at the stage where people have gone away. They said, I've, I've got all the information right. They're going to go and check out the market. They're going to check out whether you're the best or not. What you need to do at that point, though, is a very specific thing. And this is where, where, where the, the buying process, in my opinion, is fundamental. You have to give people a test drive. So they've now got all the information. And you just say, they say, oh, that sounds exactly like what I want. Fantastic. Would you like to have a go? And where I would be, what I would be doing now as a business is I would be investing all the money that I used to spend on advertising and pay-per-click on an amazing test drive. Um, and now you can see where this comes out of the car industry, because of course, if you go and buy a car, you kind of take it for a drive down the road. But you don't take it for a drive down the road to see if it's got five wheels, you know, the four on the outside and the one you use to steer it, or whether the, the blinker makes a noise or whatever. You take it to sort of imagine what it would be like to be the owner of that car, to see if you if it fits your style, if it's kind of comfortable and it's, you know, the dashboard and it's just the atmosphere of the car and everything. That's what you're testing. So what you have to do now, whatever you're selling, whether it's a product or service or indeed yourself, you've got to give people the ability to have a go. And we call this response. So in other words, you, what you're trying to do is elicit a response from the prospect to say, actually, this really does work for me. Yeah, I really like this. And you go, fantastic. Take it away for the weekend. Go for away for the weekend and try it out. Test drive it. Go on, off you it's go. The old, it's the old puppy dog clothes. Of course it is. Of course it is. Take it off, right? And then they go, yeah, great. And then I'll see you Sunday night. And you go up, turn up Sunday night. You say, right, I've come to collect the, uh, I've come to collect the car. Well, no, you can't have it back. Why not? Well, because I've I've promised I've promised my parents that I'm going to go up to the to to see them in in it, and I go well. Oh, well sorry, we've got to take it back. And you can do this with any product or service. And you say, well, we, you know, we're not a charity, we're not a not for profit, we're not a, a a social enterprise, we're not a fourth sector, you know, B corp company. You know, I'm sorry, we have to take take the product back. And they go, well, you can't do that. That's ridiculous. And you go, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, they're not in business to, 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 to give this to you. And, you know, I, don't, I really don't know. Well, how do we solve this problem? I said, well, I don't really know. You know, I can't keep it. Oh, actually, I do have one idea. And they go, well, what is it? What is it? And I said, well, you give us money and you can keep it. And I go, okay. <laughs> they don't even ask the price if you've got this right. They just say, yeah, of course. Of course, because I've now integrated it into the way I do things. Now, at that point, marketing people, uh, salespeople, they go, fantastic. Took the suspect, turned them into a prospect, took them from, from cold to warm to hot, 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 and now they've been converted into a sale. You just hand them over to after sales, right? And they, they go off for lunch. Well, of course, what we found is this is where the, the tire really hits the road because people hand over their money and now they've absolutely qualified their expectations, their anticipations, the promise, everything that you, you mentioned earlier, Marcus. They've qualified all that. So at this point, this is where you really need to apply marketing thinking because you've got to make the experience of being an owner amazing whatever it is. And there isn't a single thing that you can't do that. And we call this usage. And, you know, the way I demonstrate this as often is I show, I, I get out uh, uh, the, the box that an Apple iPhone comes in. And I ask an audience, you know, how many of you have got an Apple iPhone? Stick the hands up. Keep your hands up if you've still got the box, right? And then all the hands stay up. And I go, well, why, why have you still got the box? And they go, oh. And these people say, oh, I might sell it. Oh, really? Yeah, no, no one in its original box. Right, okay, when you sell it, it's going to be pretty trashed, isn't it? So pretty in this, you know, what? And the reason why they keep it is because the box is beautiful. It's always amazing. It opens in a certain way. And there's a, there's a story behind that as well. But about allegedly Steve Jobs rejecting the first iPhone 3 in its box because he didn't like the box and they had to go and design the box before he would he would look at the prototype of the working iPhone 3. Well, everything down to the cellophane and the sound it made. Everything. And the, exactly. the pop when you open the box, it's everything beautiful. about it everything. was got through. If you keep the prospect or the customer at the heart of everything that you do, if you don't, then there is a disconnect. The, uh, the experience for them starts to fall down and crumble. And that's where things salespeople, I make sure that after they've made the sale, that, sorry, after the transaction has happened, they are involved in the whole handover to the uh, customer experience or to the, uh, the post-sales piece and that they maintain that contact and conversation with them because I don't believe the sale is over 
until the customer comes back to you weeks or months or even years later and says, Barnaby, you know, initially we had all that choice and whatever, but I'm so glad we decided to go with you. Fantastic decision. Best decision I've ever made. I'm yep. delighted. That's yep. when the sale is complete. I, the transaction's I, I, over when the money moves into your account. I, I the think sale isn't complete till then. I absolutely agree with that. Now, it's interesting you've been swearing at me so regularly with the C word. So I'm going to give you something else to use instead of the C word, because you're right. Once the transaction's taken place, you can't really call them a prospect anymore because they're giving you the money for the thing. They're now using, using your product or service at, at usage level. You've made that amazing. We grappled with, with other C words like consumer and things like that to try and get that around. And then we did, we did a piece of work. It must be about 11 years ago now to say, what, what should we, what, what, well, how do we describe the people who've now bought from you and we can't use the C word? Because it was a, it was a, it was a struggle, because what, what do you call them? And you, you'll be fascinated that we spent another three months coming up with the following phrase. And we now talk about everybody post-purchase as a paying prospect. Now, there's a reason for that. And I did psychology as a degree, so you'll, you'll, you'll understand what. I am in neuroscience trying to ensure that companies recognize that in spite of the fact that people are using your product or service, that they are paying you money, right? They are still susceptible to better deals outside. And so everybody else is treating them as a prospect and you're treating them as the C word. And what the C word normally means is it means minimum intervention, maximum profit. The bean counter sit there, don't give stuff to the people who are giving us money. Because every time you do that, that costs us money and it erodes the profit margins. So the mindset mm -hmm. in post-purchase, in most organizations I go into, is minimum intervention, maximum profit. And I have a real problem with that because this is where the tire has hit the road. This is where people have handed over money. This is where their expectations must be exceeded all the time. And the way we, we embed this in the companies we work with is we create a culture of saying you are dealing with paying prospects so you've got to give the same insights that you're feeding out of the top of the bucket to capture people who are heading towards you give them to your buyers first give them the tips ring them up ask them and you know there's all this when was the last time you rang your top 10 customers and asked them how they were don't try and sell them anything don't ring them up and say, we've got a new product. You just ring them up and say, how are things going? It's been a tough year. How are you doing? All this sort of thing. Just so that they sound like they're on your agenda, that you're being looked after. Yes. You know, So few people... Yeah, that's so a hate crime. A hate crime? Why is that a hate yeah. crime? How are you today? No, 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 that's not... That, that, I didn't... Okay, so I didn't mean that. How are you today is a precursor to a sales call, right? That's not what I mean. Yeah, yeah, no, but, but it, it's, just, it's the equivalent of a hate crime, phoning up and just catching up. Why would you bother them? Uh, it, you know, because, it, it's because, important that you're bringing value. Okay, the value is that I'm thinking of you, yeah? You're one right. of our, our top paying prospects. We're just checking everything's going okay. Things are okay with you. Is the product delivering what we want? Is the service delivering? Is there anything that's not firing on all cylinders? What could, what you're doing is you're demonstrating care. That's I accept. Okay. But the right. problem is the way it's executed normally. Yeah, I get is, that. Oh, I'm, just, I'm just failing to find out how you're getting on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's disingenuous because it isn't about interest in the paying no, prospect. No, And actually, that's why I was saying that you should use the insight that you're developing at the top of the bucket. You ring them up and say, look, I know we haven't spoke for a while, but we've, we've just published a new paper or we've 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 come up with a new way of using our product or something like that and we just wanted to let you know because you're one of our regular customers we wanted you to be have a head head start on that over and above you'll suddenly see in our marketing communication that we're saying we've got a new one of these or another that or it does this or something like that. so that's where you add the value i agree yeah i, I agree value right. but, but and so yes uh, you're absolutely right it should the, the call should be an added value call but it may be just I, 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 I'm afraid I, I, I do find that if I ring people up and say, I was thinking of you today, I was just thinking, actually, I have a thing called a lucky bucket, which sounds ridiculous. It's just here on my desk. And all the business cards that I collect, I put in the lucky bucket. And when I've got five minutes, I just grab one out at random and I ring the number on it. And I go, hi, blah, blah, blah. And they go, oh, I was 
And you know what people often say if, if I'm not in a, in a commercial relationship with them? They say, well, I was thinking about you the other day. And I was going, oh, okay, what were you thinking about? And of course, they weren't. Of course, it's just a British way of saying, of saying oh, you know, th- thanks for calling. And I say, I pulled your card out of my lucky bucket. And they go, oh, what's the lucky bucket? And then we talk about that. And before you know it, you're in a little, nice little chat. And they go, oh, actually, do you know what? I was talking to Fred the other day, and, and he, he needs somebody like you. Maybe I'll, I'll connect you or whatever. So it's kind of a cool way. But that's at usage. Make the experience absolutely amazing post-purchase. Treat the buyers as paying prospects. The only difference between them before they bought and after they bought is that they're buying. They're paying for the services or products that you've got. Treat them in mindset terms as a prospect at all times. That you, you're excited, okay. you're energetic, you're always enthusiastic. And if you get that right, you then create what's the final step in the brand bucket, which is the bottom of the bucket, which we call loyalty. And no, so few marketing plans that I, I get to see have anything to about loyalty on them at all. And that's the way you okay. create. It's madness, isn't it? It's complete madness because it's where all the yeah. value is in your business. They're the ones that are paying the mortgages and the staff costs and the overheads and all that sort of thing and indeed contributing profits. And nobody looks after them. Now, there's two reasons for looking after them. First of all, if you've got an ongoing relationship with them, which is full of added value and they're keeping looking after them, they might just spend more money with you. Funny that because they can't be bothered to go through these blimmin' six steps again with somebody else because it's hard graft. Right. And secondly, you become part of their image dimensions. They become defined by the fact that they use your products or service with whom they have a great relationship. So they will become your advocates and start finding new people and recommending people to come in at the top of your bucket again. So the six steps are awareness, leads, have I heard of you, image match, I like you because you're like me, facts match, I know what you're going to give me, response, what's the test drive, can I have a go, immerse people in your value proposition, then the purchase takes place, then what you do is you make the the purchase amazing through usage, and then loyalty. So awareness, image match, facts match, response, usage, loyalty, they're the six steps. Now I can tell you that we've been applying that model to thousands and thousands of brands for the last 35 years. Excellent. Okay, that's been really insightful. Thank you for that. And uh, actually, surprisingly, we're in violent agreement about pretty much everything. Yes, I know. Well, we I'd we... like to take the conversation to another uh, area. Of course. I see so many people trying to create a presence on social service because they don't appear to stand for anything. They do more harm than good because of the message they convey their behavior. So can we spend a few minutes talking about how to build a really powerful personal brand? Yeah, so the way you produce, that you build any, the, the one single foundation stone that every single brand should have is a value proposition. Now, we have a very clear methodology, again, developed over the last 30 years for developing a value proposition. Again, it has, it has four value sets within it. And the value sets go as follows. You have to define your behavioral values. They all begin with B, behavioral values. So what's your style? You have to define what your benefits are, what the benefits are that you you provide people. And then what you need to provide is what you want people to believe about you after they have interacted with you or bought your product or service. And that's that's inspired by Stephen Covey's second rule, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People begin with the end in mind. All marketing must begin with the end in mind. You must know why you're looking at a piece of creative work and what it's meant to do and what it's meant to achieve. Too often, it, people don't even do that. It's crazy. And then finally, what do you want to be famous for? So you, a, a single statement of intent, a differentiator or whatever. Now, we create that as a, as a tool. It's called a brand galvanizer. It galvanizes all the values and you, you combine all the values. And a personal brand level, it's no different. You're still going to have a style. You should be clear about what your style is. And the best way to do that is ask other people what they think your style is. You're going to have a view that you have a style and other people are going to see it quite differently. So define that. And then what you do is you make all of your marketing in that style. Because then people who are drawn to that 
will have the same style values as you. So when you meet them, you'll feel immediately like you've, you've known each other for years because you've got exactly the same style value set. What you must then be clear on is what how you benefit people. Now, as an individual at a personal brand level, the benefit that you provide people is your experience, your lens on the world. It is unique. It is entirely unique, your lens on the world. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are, where you come from, uh, what your upbringing is, what your education level is, you will have a unique lens on the world around us. So what you've got to do is you've got to really understand what that uniqueness is, what made you who you are, and what you are an expert in. And if you're not an expert in anything, please don't blight me with your personal brand. I'm not interested, right? So um, I just don't want you anywhere near my world because you're cluttering up my world with rubbish noise where you have no expertise in anything. Reading one book and pretending you know what's in the book is not does not make you an expert. You've got to have tried it. You've got to have experienced it. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, it's just ridiculous. I, I'm on the speaker circuit and I often see speakers and they have nothing behind their keynote whatsoever. Nothing at all. They've read it, they've had a view, and they go out and they pretend to be an expert. That is not simply not good enough. I'm sorry. So what you've got or, to do is you... Or they were lucky once. Oh, yeah, and, oh they were lucky and once. Then, and then know, they, didn't they know. write a book. Yeah, and they, they didn't know how they got there. There's lots of people like that. So I may... I happen to be in the room when the company got sold and I made millions, and that makes me good a, a good investor. What? I worked with a very <laughs> famous footballer who said I was captain of England, and therefore I know how to run a business. And I went, okay, you're going to have to talk me through that because you're talking drivel in these meetings when it comes to business. And we were trying to do a business venture together, and we just argued all the time. And he was a very famous footballer and had indeed been captain of England. But he knew nothing about business. Just because he knew how to leadership on a football pitch doesn't mean he knows how to do leadership of people in business. It's just nonsense. Now, everybody's an expert in something. It might be you can strip down a motorcycle or you know how to cook or, you know, to, to start there and, and focus on your expertise. So now we know you can bring expertise to my world where I don't have that expertise. And if I'm looking for help in that area, and you demonstrate you're an expert in that area, and you do it in a style that's in my style, we're going to start cooking with gas. And then what you need to be doing is, is, is then really presenting yourself, everything you do, your literature, your website, whatever, whatever the tools are that you're using to present yourself in the market, they've got to be in your style. And so that actually what happens is people like that style. When they come to you, they like you because you're like them. And your sales becomes easy or selling becomes easy doing that. And then finally, build a system and a process around your ability to deliver your expertise. So create a product, create a service, create a something I can buy from you. I'm not just going to buy from you because you're you and you're an expert. Give me a way of buying. So begin with the end in mind. In the end, you've got to have a business plan. And you know if you're going to sell your services as a, as a training or course, or you're going to come and do the work and be a practitioner or whatever it is, you must define all that. So the personal brand is it's got, it's, you've got to have a product or service to sell. You've got to absolutely be clear on what your, your expertise is and then present that authentically, insightfully in a style that's your style so that People, people love you when they meet you. I hope that that kind of sums it up. That's very helpful. Excellent. Okay. So I know that we promised that we'd have a fight. So let's finish on that. You've obviously got some fairly strong opinions about selling and salespeople. Do you mind sharing those with the audience? And then uh, we, we can see where we disagree. So far, I've found pretty much everything that you said. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, and, 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 agreeable. Let me try and remove nuance then, because I think I think you're right. Language, nuance, things have evolved. If listen, if you're successful today as a, a sales person, then the chances are you understand that it's about building commercial relationships, and it isn't just about the deal. The problem I have with the majority of sales is the strategy behind sales seems to be entirely outbound, and yet the world of buying is entirely inbound and disconnect straight there. Sales is about hitting the phones. It's a numbers game. Um, it's about 
problem solution selling. It's very transactional. When you look, there are very few universities run pure sales courses, but there are lots of universities that run marketing courses. So the people who come into sales tend to be the people who are less qualified. They, they've worked at phones for you in the sales department, and then some have got good at it, and now they're salespeople. They have never learned the foundations. They claim to listen, but the only thing they listen for is an opportunity to sell the product that they've got in their back there. They are never hear what the prospect is saying. So they listen, but they never hear. They're all about the features. Some have learned FAB, features, advantages, benefits. What the difference between advantages and benefits is, is ne I've never understood. So only salespeople can explain to that. And they're very, very focused on, on price and product. And so they're looking for deals all of the time. That's not how we buy. The, the way we perceive value today is fundamentally different. We perceive value from uh, service quality and ease of buying. And salespeople do not make it easy to buy. Whereas I think marketing people, they're, 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 they're all about inbound. They're all about insight, making sense. It's about engagement, I think. My experience has been that, that marketing people tend to be more qualified. That doesn't mean you can't, can't take the same route as you would with, with salespeople. They often a, a degree level. Marketing people are about enhancing the quality of people's lives. That I think they, they, they're instinctively hear what people say because it, it's, it's a bit... And they, they constantly talk about the benefits and the value coming from business. And I think these two tribes are entirely different. In the modern day, the buyer has all the power. They are looking for solutions. They already know their problem. I don't need to be told what problem I've got. I know it already. I've checked it out online. If you have a, any kind of challenge, issue, problem, and you type it into to Google and nothing comes up on the page, you need to go and see a doctor because you're the only person in the world that's got it. Because most problems you type in will yield thousands, if not millions of results. By the time I'm 20 minutes into my problem, I've got solutions, I've got choices, I've got options, I've got all this thing. And people, people just breaking into my world and trying to sell me something. And you're right, the, the, any phone call that you pick up, if it gets past your CPS service, and they say, how is that? Barnaby Winter, how are you today? I put the phone down, yeah, straight away, because I know that's the script. It's script. Okay. I agree and accept that that is not selling. That is, frankly, piss poor. And at best, it's an attempt to be transactional. It's selfish. And it's not, it's not professional selling. That's rank amateur, order taking, zookeeping, interruptive and unwelcome. I grant you that there are not many courses now that are professional sales, but there are plenty of universities now that are starting to develop sales degrees, Harvard included. That's changing. And in fact, I'm starting a movement called Sales a Force for Good, because I agree with you that sales has earned the pariah status that it justifiably deserves because it's not about service. It's not about helping the customers solve their problems. Now, the one thing I would take issue with is that often buyers, when they recognize they have a problem, are recognizing the symptoms, not the cause. And it's really important that you get to identify the cause so you can solve the problem at source. And that's where many great salespeople are fantastic diagnosticians and help the customer, sorry, the uh, paying uh, future prospect to identify what the real problem is. Because in my experience selling for 35 years, almost never has a prospect come to me with the real problem. And they, they, they experience all these different symptoms, but unless you get to the root cause, you're never going to make the problem go away forever. And you need to partner with your customer, your prospect, in order to be able to help them not only diagnose the root cause of the problem, but then co-develop the solution with them. And that's what great salespeople do. Yeah, great okay. salespeople work with them. I think the marketing strategy to do that is to help people make sense of their problem using insight. 
all we're talking about now is the same strategy, but one's delivered one to one by a human being, and one's to one, and the other one is delivered and, through through a the, system, this, a marketing system. This is where I have a real problem with the marketing uh, profession because uh, certainly in tech, you go onto virtually any technology website, any collateral that they produce is just feature, feature, feature. Yes. They may talk about benefits, but in the fairness, when a vendor of any description talks about the benefit that they are offering, it sounds just like everybody else's benefit in their Agreed. space. Yeah. So yeah. you don't differentiate through features and benefits. Mm -hmm. What you need to understand is that customers actually rent the outcome. So if you don't understand the outcome that they are trying to address, right. and you don't understand the question that they are trying to answer, then odds are you're just going to be another bit player and a bit of noise. And this is hard. This is really difficult work. Getting right down to the root cause of their problem, identifying the better future, the outcome, where they are on the scale of zero to 10 in terms of what it's like to be at the bottom, middle, and top end of that scale will help you to understand the journey that they have to go through to achieve their desired outcome. And if you're asking the wrong questions, and this is where salespeople really need to up their game, because most of them ask bland vanilla questions intended to get the, uh, the prospect on rails, to drive them down that funnel. And no one likes to be sold like that. Most people find it offensive. It is offensive. And, yeah. and so what we have to do is we have to work with them. We need to get their fingerprints all over the uh, solution as well. That's part of what the test drive is. Yeah, but but the test but, but, drive. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, go on. The problem is in, is is in the word sales. I think what people who are responsible for generating business in an organisation should be called help to buyers. They should be people who help people to buy. So you're absolutely right. People who sell the most stuff. So this is about selling. I have no issue with selling. It's just the concept of sales. Because sales sounds like an outbound thing. I've got this product in the back of my car. I've got it in the warehouse. I've got this service back at the ranch on the computer. And I have to sell that to you. And that's my my job is to, as in sales to sell it to you whether you want it or not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an environment, whether you like it or not, to make sure that my, my thing that I've got in the back of the car, back of the van, is something that you're going to give me money but, for and I can go away. Uh, again, the root causes of that culture are further up the, uh, the food chain. Very um, much so. It's yeah. often down to how a company is structured, Correct. how people are compensated, what yeah. people are measured on. The investors very often come in and they're focused on growth at any cost. In the car industry, it's metal engine price. That's how salespeople typically sell that stuff. Yeah. But actually, if you're a woman, typically you're a few inches shorter than the average man. Yeah. And uh, yeah. what you want is visibility so that you can quite comfortably reverse park, uh, you know, scraping the, uh, the hubcaps or uh, crashing into the car. And the problem is that most designers, most engineers, don't take that uh, women into account, which right. is why very often you get these stereotypes. You get... 40% of all complaints, tickets raised to help this are caused because engineers design the product. And so we need, to, we need to start asking more sensible, intelligent questions about what the causes are of driving these terrible behaviors. And I've got to be honest, the marketing profession has a lot to answer for. Again, I'm not looking for a spat here, but a lot of marketing is just crap. We've already talked about advertising being just dull and yeah, uh, yeah. utterly pointless. $265 billion a year is spent on digital adverts. Uh, that's 4.2 quadrillion adverts that get one click or less yeah. every single year. Yeah. So they're missing that, the mark. You're right. So where's the root cause for that? I think, I think first of all, uh, the marketing industry has, has done itself no favors by becoming executional. It can only survive by being executional. There was once a, a huge advertising agency world, the, the, the industry I joined when I first came into the industry in the mid 80s, right? It was very exciting, very creative, some very clever people. That's now become a, a swathe of digital agencies. The advertising agencies have sort of drifted out and, um, and that's- Technicians. 
and they're all technicians and they're all looking at spreadsheets and they're all looking at uh, conversion rates and they're all looking at and actually you're right the humanity in That's the, it. in the six steps that are contained within the six steps of the brand market are completely absent from the marketing industry because it's all been broken down into little tiny pieces so you can go and get you can go to a linkedin shop or you can go to a, a, a an instagram shop or you can go to a PPC shop or an SEO shop, or you can go to a, a design agency, or you can go to a web company. And they're all bro we've broken up the, the industry into these tiny little profit hungry, money at any cost things. Uh, they're, 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 they're totally focused on pointless, irrelevant data. Uh, correct. That's correct. what they're being most Correct, because there's no humanity in the data. Uh, Barnaby, we've got, to come, we, we've got to bring this to a close, unfortunately. Tell me, how can people get hold of you? You can find me on LinkedIn very easily, but I'm Barnaby Winter with a Y. It's W-Y-N-T-E-R, Barnaby Winter. I have a, a website of the same name, www.barnabywinter.com. Try me there. And if you look up the brand bucket, you should find me. But it is the brand bucket. There is another company called Brand Bucket in America. It does a similar thing nothing to do with us. So just my website, LinkedIn profile, best way, or, or actually... Contact Marcus and say, great show, and he will point you towards me. Uh, I think that's probably the, then, you know, I've got him working for me then. That's fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and I'll be happy to do that. I'd love to have you back. Yeah, I would really I'd enjoy that too. Barnaby Winter, thank you. Thank you ever so much. So this is Marcus Cowkey signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you're the owner or CEO of a tech company, and your goal is to grow your business and achieve genuine, sustainable hypergrowth with highly engaged and highly productive employees and clients who stick with you year after year after year. Let's schedule a time for a brief conversation. You can reach me at marcus at laughs-last.com or via LinkedIn. And if you think you'd be a good guest or you know someone who would be, then please do get in touch and connect us. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.